Hi everyone, welcome back to Grounded Haven. Today I have another what we eat in a day video and I'm going to be sharing what we ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and also a bonus dessert. First, I'm going to be starting with breakfast, of course, and most days for us start with eggs in some form or another. Today, we are going to be having a veggie omelet, so I'm just dicing up a little bit of onion as well as a few mushrooms. And I'm going to fry those in a pan with a little bit of avocado oil for a few minutes before we add the eggs. I like to add salt immediately in the beginning, of course to add flavor, but this also helps to draw out moisture, which is especially important if you're doing veggies like mushrooms and onions, which have a lot of water. I wanna fry off a lot of that moisture and let it all evaporate out before we add our eggs to this so that we don't get a really runny omelet. While that's frying off, I'm going to slice up an orange for us to have on the side. I'm just gonna do one orange and then we usually just split it between the two of us. I'm also going to be preparing my eggs. For two people, I usually do four eggs in our omelet, which is a nice hearty portion. And I'm just cracking those into a bowl with some salt and pepper and whisking that up so that when the veggies are nicely fried off, you can see here they have started to brown up and they have shrunk in volume a little bit, which means that they've released a lot of their moisture. Towards the end of the veggies cooking, I'm also going to add a little bit of kale. That's just going to take about 30 seconds just for it to wilt down. Then I'm going to pour in my egg mixture right over this. And then I like to give it kind of like a gentle stir to lift up some of that egg that immediately starts to set along the bottom of the pan, just so that some of the runny egg can get underneath and start frying off. And then after a few minutes, I'm going to flip it, which usually goes really smoothly. But of course, once I have the camera on, somehow I can't do it properly. So my omelet did break a little bit as I was flipping it, but that's totally fine. It is not going to be a problem for the final product. Once this is flipped over, I'm adding a little bit of pepper jack cheese to one side of this, and then I can flip over half of the omelet and the residual heat from that first side is just going to melt the cheese. And I usually have my heat turned off for the last minute or so of this process because the residual heat of the pan is enough to cook that second side, which just needs a minute or so. And then I'm going to split this omelet in half and each of us usually just eats half of that omelet and that is our finished breakfast. It's super filling and it always feels good to start breakfast off with something that has some vegetables in it because it can be a little bit hard to have vegetables for breakfast. So doing a veggie omelet is a great way to do that. To top off our veggie omelet, our favorite hot sauce is Cholula. So we like to drizzle that on top. I used to think that people who put hot sauce on everything and especially eggs for breakfast were just crazy but I have completely converted and I absolutely love hot sauce on my eggs, specifically this one, not all hot sauces. It has a really nice medium heat, so it's not crazy spicy. I just really like that it's a little bit of like a vinegar base so that it adds a little bit of brightness. Next, we're going to move on to lunch. And before we go into the kitchen, I did hop out to the garden to harvest a little bit of spinach. We are going to be having tuna salad sandwiches and I thought the spinach would be a great thing to add to this. And the spinach lately has been doing really well. And I know that it's going to start bolting soon once it gets warm. So we're trying to enjoy it as much as possible right now while it's looking really good. 
So I'm just gonna go out and pick a whole bowl full of this. It's more than we need for lunch, but I figured I might as well just pick everything that was ready and I can wash it all and just keep it in the fridge. I find that I'm a lot more likely to use things like greens if they are already washed and prepped in the fridge versus if I have to go out and pick just a couple of leaves for a sandwich or something else. So after I have that all picked, I also have to make some mayo for our sandwiches because I don't have any right now. So to do that, I'm just starting off with about a third of a cup of avocado oil and also one whole egg. I also like to add a little bit of mustard. You can use yellow mustard, but I usually use Dijon mustard because I like the flavor of it. And then also some salt and pepper and lemon juice. Then I'm just going to take my immersion blender and blend that up and it is a super quick and easy way to make mayo. We never buy mayo from the store anymore because it's just so easy to make at home. It doesn't last quite as long as store-bought mayo so you do have to use it within a few weeks but I find it really convenient that we know how to make this and can just make it anytime we need it for a recipe. So usually this can be pretty runny in the beginning and what I like to do is just drizzle in more oil while my immersion blender is running and usually once you've added enough it will thicken up and you can just keep doing this until it's as thick as you like it. So you'll usually end up using between like a third to a half cup of oil total. Now we can finally move on to assembling our tuna salad. I am using this Wild Planet Skipjack Tuna, and if you're trying to look for a sustainable tuna, you wanna look for the words pull and line caught because that means that the methods that they've used to catch the tuna doesn't accidentally catch a lot of other stuff at the same time. They are literally using one person with one pole to catch the exact fish that they are fishing for versus if you use a net, you end up catching a lot of fish that you don't mean to catch and the this can harm a lot of the wildlife in the ocean. So I always look for that when I am shopping for tuna. I actually avoid a lot of brands that say things like dolphin safe because I think that's actually just a useless phrase that they're just trying to use for marketing. And I think it's much more accurate to look for the methods with which they are fishing. I do really like this Wild Planet brand. It's a little pricier, but you can really tell the difference in quality. When I take these out of the cans, you can see how they are like really full chunks of tuna versus is just like mushy tuna, which I really hate. And I just think it is worth a little bit of extra money. Whenever I open cans of tuna, our cats know the sound of the tuna can opening. So I always have to set aside just a few pieces for them to have as a little treat for them as well. This is Judy. You want some? Next, I'm going to dice up some vegetables for our tuna salad. I have two stalks of celery here, which I'm going to dice really finely. Celery is always a must have for me whenever I make any kind of salad like this. So tuna salad, chicken salad, or egg salad. I just think that the crunch and the flavor bring so much to this. Just as a side note, I don't know if this is weird, but celery is probably one of my favorite things to chop up. I don't know why, but it's just so satisfying. And if you need to practice your knife skills, I think that celery is the perfect thing to do that with. I also have a couple of scallions that I'm going to slice up finely as well. You can also use red or white onion, but we had scallions so I figured that I would just use these since they were nice and fresh. And then I also have a small bunch of parsley that I'm going to mince really finely and add to that as well. 
One other thing I like to add is usually some kind of pickled element. So sometimes I'll just dice up dill pickles, but today I had capers, so I am just finely chopping some of those to add in. And then I'm just going to add some mayo, a little bit of mustard, and some lemon juice to finish off this tuna salad. As you can see, I really like to pack a lot of vegetables in our tuna salad. This makes it stretch a little farther since that tuna is a little bit more expensive, but I also just really like that extra crunch and flavor. It really helps to improve the texture so that it's just not just like a mushy sandwich. And I'm just gonna mix this up. We go pretty light on the mayo. I don't want it to be like a creamy mess, just enough for it to kind of like bind everything together. With the addition of all of these vegetables and herbs, it just looks so fresh and crisp. It's definitely not like a tuna salad sandwich that you would get at a really sad fast food sandwich place. I mean, not naming any names, but if you know, you know. Next, I'm going to start assembling. I have a few slices of my homemade sandwich bread, and I'm going to lay a few leaves of that spinach that I just picked on one side, and then layer my tuna on top. This would be a great sandwich to like take to work or take on a picnic. And if you're going to do that, then a good way to keep it from getting soggy is to put your spinach or lettuce on each side of the tuna. So in between the bread and the tuna salad and whatever greens you put there will help it from getting too soggy. But since we're eating this immediately, I'm just gonna put the spinach on one side and cut each of our sandwiches in half. To serve alongside this, I'm also adding some bread and butter pickles. These are pickles that I made from cucumbers and onions from our garden last year. And then I also added a little bit of a dollop of hummus along with some cut veggies on the side as almost like a little bit of a side dish for our lunch. So that was our finished lunch. It's a pretty simple one, but it's really nice that a lot of the elements were homemade or grown from our very own garden. Moving on to dinner, we are going to be having some grilled portobello sandwiches. I'm starting off by making a marinade for the portobello mushrooms. I have a teaspoon or so of sugar and I'm adding a couple of tablespoons of soy sauce. I'm also going to add about a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce and then a little bit of minced garlic as well. I'm just gonna whisk that together. Oh, and then I also added some salt and pepper. And then I have two portobello mushroom caps that I'm going to let marinate in this mixture for a few minutes. I just pulled out the stems because they can be a little bit tough, but these are great to throw into your stock bag if you keep one in the freezer. And then since it was kind of hard to get them in the bowl, I just tried and spoon over some of that marinade mixture as best as I could on the inside of these mushrooms. It's okay if they don't sit in this for too long because I am going to be basting them when I grill them later on. So now onto the grill, I have it preheating and I've brushed my grates and I'm going to add my portobello mushroom caps on top of a pretty high flame here. And then I'm just spooning over more of that marinade on the inside of each of these caps. I also have some other vegetables that I'm going to be adding to the grill. I have some onion that I'm going to be grilling for our sandwich. And then I also have some cabbage that I'm going to try grilling as well as a little bit of a side dish. I've never grilled cabbage before, but I have heard that it's really good. So I'm going to be trying that out. Since this grill is new for us this year, I am basically going to grill any vegetable that I can get my hands on and we're going to do a lot of experimenting with it this year. So I'm really happy to have this new tool and to open up lots of different things to cook. So I just oiled and seasoned my onions and the cabbage and I'm just placing the cabbage directly onto the grates. We don't have a grill basket yet, so I just have to try my best not to let any of the pieces fall through but we will get one soon so that all of those little pieces of vegetables are not as finicky. So here you can see that I'm taking some of that leftover marinade and I'm basting it over the mushrooms as they cook. And I'm also doing the same thing with the cabbage as well, just because I think that flavor would be really nice for them. 
Eventually, I did decide to put the cabbage in a little bit of a foil packet because some of those leaves were catching in the fire and I thought that they needed a little bit more steam to get them to fully cook. So I just placed them in the foil packet and put them to the side while the mushrooms continue cooking. I also wanted to fry up some eggs to have on our sandwiches. So I am using the side burner on our grill just to fry those up. I love having a nice runny egg on burgers or sandwiches. It just adds a little bit more like luxuriousness to the sandwich and it creates almost like its own sauce when the yolk is really nice and runny. And I love having this side burner on our grill as well so that I don't have to go inside and use a burner if I just wanna do a small task like frying these eggs up. I can just do everything outside while I'm grilling. Here's what the final meal looks like with our completed sandwich and that grilled cabbage on the side which was really good. I think it would be better if I had a grill basket to do it. Maybe I could get it cooked a little bit better but it was pretty good and we enjoyed it. Here is an inside look at the sandwich. I used some of my homemade burger buns that I pulled out from the freezer. And then we've got a layer of hummus, the portobello mushrooms, a little bit of cheese, our runny egg, and then some spinach. So it's a really jam-packed and delicious sandwich. For dessert that day, we had a slice of flan, which I had made earlier that week. This is my new favorite dessert to make that uses up lots of eggs, which is awesome. So I'm starting off by making a super simple caramel. I just have a third of a cup of sugar in a small saucepan, and this just has to melt, which is going to take a few minutes. So while that is melting down, I'm going to prepare an egg mixture. I'm starting off with five eggs here which I'm going to crack into a bowl and then I'm going to add another third cup of sugar to this along with two and a half cups of milk. So if you've never heard of flan before, it's really popular in Spain and Mexico, although it originally came from ancient Rome as a way to use up excess eggs, which is kind of funny because that's exactly why I'm making it as well. And it's basically like a custard that has a caramel sauce on top of it. I feel like it's one of those things that looks really complicated to make, but it is super simple. I made this the other week and I couldn't believe how easy it was. The ingredients are very simple. It's just eggs, milk, sugar, and a little bit of vanilla. And that is it. And you also don't need any special equipment either, which is really nice. I also really liked how this recipe that I found uses just regular whole milk because I have seen recipes and I've tasted flan where they use evaporated milk or sweetened condensed milk and even though those are good, I really like how this recipe had a really nice like fresher flavor. It didn't have kind of like that processed flavor that condensed or evaporated milk can have. So anyway, I'm just whisking all of these ingredients together to combine them and the last thing I need to add is my vanilla extract. I'm using some of my homemade vanilla extract here. This is the vanilla extract that I made using bourbon, and I thought that this kind of like deeper flavor would work really nicely with that golden caramel kind of flavor we're going to have later on. So I'm adding about a teaspoon and a half of the extract. And then what I also like to do whenever I'm making like custardy desserts like this is I take one of the beans that are in my vanilla extract jar and I don't scrape my beans out when I'm making vanilla extract because that way the beans stay inside. And anytime I'm making a dessert like this where I want those little specks, I just give it like a light little squeeze and some of those beans just come right out into whatever you're making. It's a great way to have that visual effect of having those vanilla flecks especially when you're making a light dessert like this where you can really see them so anything like a cheesecake or a custard or ice cream I really like to just take my plump beans and just give them a little bit of a squeeze so that I can get both the flavor and the visual appeal of the vanilla beans Here's a look at how that sugar is doing, melting down a little bit. You can see that a little bit of that sugar is starting to melt and turn into a caramel color. And once everything is completely melted, you're pretty much done. You don't have to add like cream or butter or anything like that. 
It's just super easier just melting sugar, which is really great because I've tried making other kinds of caramel before and they definitely aren't for me. And this is just like the easiest way you can do it and it is completely foolproof. And you don't even need to worry about if it reaches like a certain temperature or anything like that. Once it's melted, you can just place this into a pie plate or even a cake pan if you don't have a pie plate and you're just trying to cover like the bottom surface of the pie plate. So I like to kind of spread this out a little bit as I'm pouring it, just to try and get it a little bit more evenly distributed, but it's okay if you don't cover the whole bottom. This will harden pretty quickly against that colder pie plate, and that's totally okay because once we bake this later on, it will remelt down. Once that caramel is there, it has completely hardened pretty much immediately and I'm just going to pour my custard mixture right on top of that. I'm trying to pour that pretty close to the top, but I'm leaving just a little bit of space because I do have to move this into my oven and if I fill it too high, then I am going to spill it on the way. So we'll fill it up the rest of the way once it is mostly in the oven. So I have a cast iron pan here just because my pie plate can fit inside of this because we are going to make a little bit of like a hot water bath for it so that it can cook more gently. Kind of the same way you would do with a creme brulee or a cheesecake, but you can just use a roasting pan, whatever fits the vessel that you are baking your flan in. So I'm filling that up with some hot water and then I'm going to lay my pie plate in there and you want the water to come up the sides of your dish about an inch. So once that's in there, I'm going to very carefully move this into a 325 degree oven where it's going to bake for an hour and honestly this is the hardest part of the process making the caramel and the custard mixture is so easy and fast but for this part of the process you really have to have some patience and go as slowly as you can so that you don't get your custard mixture everywhere and I like to put it most of the way in and then finish off with as much mixture as I can fit to just top it off I did have a little bit of extra mixture left over, so I just made two mini flans, but I think next time I will resize this batch to have four eggs and two cups of milk instead. So that's gonna bake in the oven for about an hour, and to check when it's done, it's very similar to creme brulee. You wanna give it a little bit of like a wiggle, and you should still see a little bit of movement. It shouldn't have like ripples on the top, but you should see a little bit of a jiggle. You don't want it to be completely set because then it is overcooked. You still want it to be very velvety and soft. When it comes out of the oven, I like to move it to a wire rack to cool completely to room temperature. And then this has to sit in the fridge for three to four hours so that it can completely chill before you eat it. And I usually don't cover it with anything because if you cover it with something, it can create condensation, which will fall back onto your flan and kind of make the surface look a little bit messy. So here we are after the flan has completely chilled and you can see that I'm running a paring knife around the edges just so that this will release easily from the pie plate and then we're going to have to invert this because what you see here is actually the bottom of the flan and then the top is going to have that caramel layer once we flip it over. So we have to invert this by placing a large plate on top and then quickly flipping it over. I'm going to do this over a rimmed baking sheet because I know from experience my plate is not quite large enough to fit the flan. Unfortunately, this is just the largest plate that we have that doesn't have a very big lip. So I know that some of the caramel is going to spill over the edge. But other than that, the flip went pretty smoothly. It's kind of like a fun part of the process, but also a little bit nerve wracking. So just try and do it as smoothly and swiftly as possible. Once it's flipped over, you can see how that caramel layer that we had at the bottom before has kind of remelted while this bakes in the oven and has created its own caramel sauce for this flan. And now I'm just going to slice it into eight pieces. This would definitely look a lot nicer if you had like a larger serving plate. It looks a little bit messy on our smaller plate, but that's okay because it still tastes delicious. I think custard desserts like this are my favorite kind of dessert. I could pass on like cookies or brownies any day, but give me any kind of like sweet egg custard and I'm there for it. The flavor is just so mild, but also creamy and luxurious at the same time. You get sweetness from the caramel, of course, and then other than that, it's just those really classic flavors of egg, milk, and vanilla. And the texture of this is just so silky smooth. It is just set, but you can see when I lift it up, there's still a little bit of like a softness and a bend to that flan. And then of course we have to spoon some of that extra caramel sauce on top of it as well. 
This flan is seriously so so good and it's probably very dangerous that it's so easy to make because we can finish this whole thing in like two or three days. But if you have chickens and are getting a ton of eggs because it's springtime like we are, then this is a great recipe to try out to use up that influx of spring eggs. So there's that deceptively simple, very delicious dessert to finish off this what we eat in a day video. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing all the meals that I shared with you. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again in the next video.